Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. See, the network tried to get rid of us, Blake, and they just they can't put us down. No, they can't Even, win. No. They Even can't though, do it. We were gone for two weeks, but we're back here. We're we're back. The network couldn't bring us down. No. Nope. We we have no network. We are ourselves. We are the network. We are the network. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. We're back in the studio. Finally, thank God. It's been a minute. Yeah, it has. Uh, it's episode 130. Uh, it's May 27th, 2019. And you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. Uh, we have some, oh, this is this is new, excellent news stories. Uh, and we're going to be tackling some questions from the community uh, this week. So we have what Tesla on autopilot slamming into a stalled car on highway. Oh, great. So some nice, we're going to start with some nice uplifting news. Uh, DHL launching its first regular, fully automated and intelligent urban drone delivery service. Uh, and then taking a look at Samsung's deep fake AI, bringing still images to life. Amazon working on a device that can read human emotions and Google glasses, fresh update. Uh, so, yeah, that'll be that'll be fun stuff to talk about. We've been absent for the last couple of weeks, so we got some programming notes here. Uh, you can find us on YouTube every Tuesday around noon Pacific. Um, and uh, yeah, we are here. We're back. Yeah, we, it's like a quick summer hiatus. Absolutely, it was good for both of us. I think. Yeah. So I mean, like, just to let our listeners in on behind the curtain. So uh i recorded an episode with our colleague sabrina and then you tried to get something going on the next week but ran yeah. into some technical difficulties like guys we really tried we had everything set up the show notes were made like show was ready to go yep and blake couldn't figure out how to run the recording stuff so nick's gonna have to teach me how it's, it's so okay we'll, <laughs> next time <laughs> we'll make sure it doesn't happen again but um yeah we're back last week uh you know we had some sickness both of us were not feeling well so it just did not happen last week and now we're back so hello welcome back <laughs> it's so good to be here with everybody once again yes it is but blake it's been like i just i was talking to you about this before we came into the studio it's been a month since you and i have been in the podcast studio together yeah so i'm dying to know what have you been up to oh my goodness so Nick, like I don't know how many years ago this is now that we talked about doing this, but at one point you and I were talking about going and seeing at the time the new Star Wars movie in like 4D. Oh yeah, are we doing that this year? We got to do that. We this should year. do that Let's this do year because I went and saw Detective Pikachu in 4D and or 4DX, whatever they call it, and it was insane. Yeah, it was like riding Star Tours for an hour and a half, which was amazing for me. Elise was not so stoked on it. Uh, but it was a nut. It was a crazy experience, and so I see why it was appealing to even want to uh, try and do that for Star okay. Wars. So now I'm like super jazzed about this. We have to make this happen. Yeah, It'd be that I think it's much more possible this time because now I'm fully on board. So I want to like buy tickets immediately when they come Great. out, and I will be down here then. So oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, because yeah. you're gonna move on down. Yeah, we are moving. So that's that's another thing, and we'll figure out the show for that. But there might be some moving. Uh, on my part, which means perhaps I will not be around for a week for a recording, but we'll see. Anyway, not anything to talk about yet. But yeah, I'm probably gonna run into the same thing because I'm actually gonna move too. Oh, I'm gonna move closer up to where you are. Oh, really? No, not really. Oh, okay. but I am gonna move so north. We're gonna switch. Yeah, we're gonna switch places. <laughs> Maybe we'll end up at the same place. Maybe we could just like get two rooms side by side. And there you then, go. And then we could just record, uh, you know, right outside in our front kind of communal area. That'd be so nice. That'd be fun. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and... Oh, wait, I didn't talk what I'm talking about here. Yeah, what's been going on with you, man? <laughs> Trying to get it's, right into the I show. Know. He's I very excited. I'm just so excited. We got so many news stories. Um, well, you know, okay, so preparing for a kid over here. So I've been looking for kind of uh, life accelerators to make our lives uh, easier and more efficient. And um, one of those things is, uh, I'm sure... You've seen a lot of this is is uh, a lot of these stores and uh, websites are now coming out with this sort of uh, mobile order and pickup thing where you like. Oh, yeah. You, you basically just on your phone, you do the thing, you drive there, you pick it up and you're good. Um, or like uh, Target's doing this thing where you basically add everything to your cart. You can set up favorites and then you just drive up and they have a cart shopping cart waiting for you and they just load it into your trunk and then 
all your like department store shopping is done. That's pretty epic. And um, I actually saw on an Amazon box the other day that they're starting to do that through Whole Foods too. Yeah. They'll even deliver your groceries if you order enough ahead of time or whatever it may be. Yeah. So I'm trying to find all these accelerators and uh, most of them have been successful. There was one instance where um, we ordered Chipotle over the weekend and uh, showed up right on time and somebody else had taken our bag because they don't have any sort of validation, right? You show up, you pick up the bag, and that's it. Isn't that wild? Because there's a salad place that I order from like almost every day at work. And I do the same thing. I'll get online, order it, set the time. But there's like nobody checks to make sure that you're picking right. up the right one or and like, it's like scanning a QR code or anything. And I was just thinking about like one sort of thing that you can do to to make sure peace of mind. You like you you print out a barcode on the receipt that they attach to your order and then you have a barcode that's matching on your phone and if they just had technology that they scan scan and if it matches you're good to go and that's some sort of validation that says hey this customer came and picked it up that gives them an extra set of metrics uh, and it gives you peace of mind that no one's going to walk off with your food it does require an extra pair of eyes for the pickup window but you know like that's trade off i don't know i i just been thinking about you know both from how easy it is from a, a, a customer perspective and also how easy it is from an employee perspective. So like this target one that I just mentioned. So I tried this the other day and you know, they, you, you set up your order and you say, okay, pick up. And then it says your order will be ready within two hours. We'll let you know when we've basically picked up everything off the shelves. That's pretty fast. Uh, it is. So it's same day. Um, and that's fine. I was expecting that. And so, uh, you know, it says, just let us know when you're on our way. And I said, okay, on my way. And my target's about 10 minutes away from me. And so I, uh, I I drove the 10 minutes. And I'm wondering, you know, if when I said I'm on my way, how long it took somebody to notice that and then go outside and wait. Because that's a lot of time waiting outside that, you know, you don't need to be. And that's like wasting money for the company but i'm sure they have it to spare like I d- i'm wondering if there's ways that they they either are or could be optimizing it with uh like a few location you, services yeah, or something like you yeah. know because you know all the apps ask nowadays like c- can i monitor where you are yeah and i could see if it's like, sending like your that. data yeah because yeah. that would that would be the best purpose for that kind of stuff right and it would let them know within when then they're like within a one mile radius or something and then you just go out and wait for them yeah so nobody's wasting time there's right. no like company time wasted that kind of stuff but yeah. like you said i, I don't know I, I would assume i feel like target's got a little bit of disposable income when it comes to testing these kind of software cases yeah. out and that kind of stuff anyway long story short it's all been pretty great for optimizing uh my time and so uh i've been looking for things to fill my time in other ways and uh you know i just have a lot of free time now when i'm not you know sitting at target for 30 minutes grabbing everything off my shelf which is good right because that'll help once you like get closer to having the kid and then when you've had the kid because then every you already have all these optimization systems set right. up that you can that's, like a tackle it or you and justine can tackle each time you have to go somewhere or yeah whatever you need to do that's really the hope right is that like you know in that first month we're just going to be so drained as new parents we're going to be like what what to expect and it's like okay we need the target run we need you know soap and shampoo and uh deodorant and cat litter and water and all these things right baby supplies and it's just like i don't i don't want to i mean i might want to break but i i will want to come back and be at least able to to share in that misery you know so it's sure like, yeah so like just put add it to my cart and you can save your favorites and whatever and just boom there you go and we need these things and pick up and come back in like 20 minutes and i'm sure not too long away for you especially because you have like the you have the Echo Dot at home, yeah. right? So at some point, I'm sure all that stuff will be very integrated, hopefully, that you, you could do, yeah, do you, some of that voice stuff like can, for that. You can do it now. Um, I think the reason why we don't is, like, I was really into those dash buttons, the Amazon dash buttons that you, like, basically put around. So, like, the garbage cans, right? You put the you put the dash button where the garbage ca- uh, trash bags are, and whenever you run out or running low, you press the button, and it just reorders the thing. Oh, and it shows gotcha. up to your door. And so they discontinued those. And now they're very much all about the voice ordering, right? Ordering sure. trash cans or uh, trash bags. And I, I just haven't, I don't know, I haven't adopted that yet. And I don't know what it would take to make me do that. Because I'm very much like a, I, I feel like the drive up pickup thing is is kind of a, a, a nice happy medium. Because it's like I add stuff to my cart. I'm not ready to commit to it yet. Um, and then I can start to see like, it's not very, it's not like a nickel and dime process. It's not like 
I ordered this thing and then I ordered this thing and it's easy to lose track of exactly how much you've spent. It's like, I'm still going to do a run. I'm still going to see all these things that I'm getting, but it's one chunk and I have a better idea of my spending. I don't know. It's, it's almost like a virtual receipt that you can look at yeah. while you're adding stuff to your cart and all that kind of stuff. That's interesting because yeah. I know voice is going to get bigger and bigger as time goes on, but like dealing with a problem like that, that's a little bit harder, right? Unless yeah. you've got some kind of hologram software that's going to show you what I, you're adding to your cart or something. I just don't know what my barrier to entry is on that. And I'd be curious to get like some of our listeners um feedback too like if you've used these systems like what do you what what do you think works for you and and that kind of stuff um okay blake but i'm i'm dying to jump into this news let's do so it it's been a while let's get into the human factors news this is the part of the show all about you guessed it human factors news this is where we talk about everything related to the field of human factors it's be anything from what do we got in there some privacy for sure uh what do we got got uh, a little automation and vehicles we've got some of course some UAVs, everything from yeah. there, and then a little bit of Google, gra- gla- Google Grass. Google Glass. <laughs> that's, a, that's a separate product. It's only legal in a couple states. There you go. Uh, yeah, as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game for us to talk about. Blake, what do we have up first this week? So up first, we have in a recently reported incident, a Tesla on autopilot, according to the driver at least, ran into a stalled vehicle on a highway, doing so while the Tesla was moving along at a nice speed of around 60 miles an hour. So according to the driver, the Tesla uh, driver of the Tesla, another car cut in front of him, staying there fleetingly, and then moved rapidly over to the next lane. And within a few moments, it became apparent that the car wa- was stalled up ahead, and he, in his driving his Tesla, was actually going to ram right into it full force. So it might be instructive to consider how this kind of crash may have actually occurred in a Tesla on autopilot, pilot, along with the ramifications for autom- autonomous vehicles, su- such as self-driving cars in general. So in theory, the Tesla autopilot should not have been sus- susceptible to this kind of mind freeze that a human being might be susceptible to and would have unemotionally and computationally calmly calculated how to handle the matter. But this in- would involve some detecting of the object ahead and interpreting the that the object was not moving, and then ascertaining that the Tesla was moving toward that stalled object at a speed that it couldn't stop quick enough. So Tesla will typically point out in these situations that these kinds of incidents that often occur are on the human driver, and it is their responsibility, not the car or the manufacturer or the autopilot, to make sure that they don't run into these kinds of situations. So Nick, we've bad, <laughs> we've backed and forth about this a bunch on the podcast. Right. Like where really does the blame fall? Like blame is probably the wrong term to use, but like who's in charge who's when we're ta- when we're talking about autonomous driving? And of course, it makes sense for from Tesla's perspective to be like, oh, it still should be the human operator. Yeah, I feel like eventually we'll get there, and the automation would have been able to detect something like this. It's like, it, I feel like. It's the human operator's fault is a great fallback for um, our AI is not advanced enough to pick up this type of thing yet. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I think it is important for all drivers to know that in this experimental, like, let's be clear, it is experimental. The automation, there's some automation that works really well, like uh, staying in your lane, um, being able to detect cars around you in traffic. Um, However, at high speeds and detecting a stopped object you know when the system is anticipating a a continuous stream of speed uh it you know like that's that's a very unlikely scenario and probably something that tesla systems hasn't really encountered a whole lot of and doesn't know how to tackle so yeah it's it's i guess the human operator's fault in this case like that's kind of where i'm falling here like you should have been paying attention and it's easy to you know they, they trusted the system too much. I guess you know, like it's kind of funny because we're we're consistently trying to put ourselves in this situation where we are going to be taken out of the loop, and I, as this technology gets better and better, we're just going to have to deal with like either we force the technology to be as good as it can be, which is going to have to learn from situations like this. Thank goodness this guy survived and he didn't like die in the crash, like we've heard before, of like Teslas or auto pilot cars hitting pedestrians or anything like that but it does show that there's still we are like you said still in a very experimental phase for this kind of stuff because i mean 
you're trying to deal with every situation a human is ready to deal with. Let's right? save my sword in front of you. You know kind of the actions to take, or if you see a stall vehicle, you know the actions to take. But expecting kind of like an AI that's relatively new in terms of how much experience it's had on the road, know to how to react to what's going on. Like if somebody cuts you off and then you all of a sudden see a stalled vehicle, I can see it happening. I mean, as bad as it is, hopefully it's a learning moment. It improves the actual automation behind Tesla's autopilot. Yeah, one thing that weirds me out is like there's these compilation videos of, of Tesla kind of, pre- or these Teslas predicting crashes that happen before they actually happen. And I'm wondering like what were the circumstances, I'm sure we'll learn more as time goes on, but like what were the circumstances around this specific incident where the system didn't detect it? Because, uh, you know, that's that's a gap in the uh, automation. And that's something that, you know, the, the Tesla coders could look at and basically say, OK, this why didn't this case work? And what other uh, environmental cues can we pick up on? So that way this doesn't happen again. And I mean, you know, as time goes on, we're just going to patch all these holes. And I, I don't know, I'm, I'm very optimistic with with uh, automation, especially once you get more automated vehicles than non-automated vehicles on the highway. I think that's the tipping point for uh, safety. Well, that's really the key, right? Like yeah. A lot of this is having to deal with unpredictable human behavior. Um, I mean, you might be able to get some cues off the cars or experience driving, but if there was more automated vehicles than non-automated, I feel like this would be a lot less frequent. And it's not even that this is happening at a like really high, unprecedented rate. It's just happening. It's a new technology that people are not 100% on board or comfortable with. And it, it has, not just from Tesla, but it has like cost people lives this is kind of terrifying. this is yeah i probably shouldn't have pulled this up while we were watching we're watching a um a crash compilation of tesla vehicles is that thing just back it up it, in the middle of the highway yeah it's it's definitely oh it's having a freak out yeah so anyway um i ultimately think did it end up on the stairs oh that had to be an accident yeah anyway <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, yeah, I definitely think it. Uh, this this one verdict uh, fault at uh, operator. Yeah, it's definitely st- definitely stops with the operator at this point. I wonder something that I wanted to mention when you said it, and I doubt this is a problem, but with because even like, watching some of these compilation videos, they're so oh my god, <laughs> just straight through the window. That's not oh, all right. Man. But watching some of these compilation videos, it looks like the Teslas are able to get out of some pretty interesting yeah, problems. I agree. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's like lapses and having to update the software or something like that that impacts like how things are, how well the Tesla is able to deal with you know more problematic situations. Like, do you have to like you like the same way that you restart a Windows machine to upgrade it? Do you have to do the same same thing with your Tesla? And can you accidentally not upgrade to the newest software? Right. And what happens if it breaks your car? Or like. I, not bricks your car but like what if there's some fatal security flaw that prevents the car from uh i don't know like it it undoes i don't even know what i'm saying like it undoes some previous uh, update that you know that those circumstances would have been known and then the next update completely reverts that because of some like I code goes through validation. I don't know what I'm even worried about. Anyway, that, that's a, that's like. But say. you bring up a good point though, because like even still with code going through validation, like on websites and stuff, you can run you can run up on maybe other endpoints not being updated enough, or like a you create a software update based off of some sort of API endpoint that you typically hit, but maybe that doesn't update, or there's there's, there's something wrong in the code. I mean, there's definitely ways to double check, and I'm sure there's a plethora of you know like unit testing that goes through these kind of releases but i feel like there is a lot lot of instant or a lot of leeway in terms of what could be causing some cars to be able to react quick enough versus others not being able to yeah anyway time will tell i think uh be interesting to see more tesla crash avoidance compilations because the crash ones uh they're kind of terrifying. Yeah. All right. What's up next? All right. So DHL Express, the world's leading international express delivery service provider and the world's leading intelligent autonomous aerial vehicle company, Ehang, have entered into a strategic partnership to jointly launch a fully automated and intelligent smart drone delivery solution to tackle the last mile delivery challenges in, in urban areas of China. So the launch ceremony was held last week at the Ehang Command and Control Center in China with the attendance of senior executives from both companies. And this cutting-edge solution takes its inaugural flight for a DHL 
customer, making DHL the first international express company to provide such a service in China, and maybe even around the world. So it marks a new milestone in both the company's continuous effort to bring innovative and intelligent solutions with greater automation to the market, using the most advanced UAV and eHang's newly launched Falcon series, featuring the highest level of intelligence, automation, safety, and reliability. The new drone delivery solution overcomes the complex road conditions and traffic congestion common to many urban areas, and it reduces one-way delivery time from 40 minutes to about 8 minutes. It can save costs up to 8 percent per delivery with even a reduced... Hey guys, this is Nick here. Unfortunately, during the recording of this episode, uh, I may have mentioned that we are making some behind-the-scenes changes... And uh, unfortunately, it uh, recorded the DHL video audio. If you want to enjoy the full dance party, you can check us out on YouTube. Otherwise, you can uh, just enjoy the rest of our conversation after the dance party subsides. And on with the show. Um, it is kind of cool, though, to see uh, you know, other companies tackle this space. And I think the exciting thing to me is that competition drives innovation and so you know if if dhl comes up with something that amazon hasn't thought of like i i don't know if amazon or google have thought of these like little kiosks here that basically a delivery person is coming up to putting the thing in and saying go to this address like it's it's almost like a satellite launching area where it launches the drone from this location it always has the return home and presumably that all st- that stuff is all automated and um i know we saw like a couple of weeks ago like there was this like drone delivery from a UPS van or something where it like shoots off and then delivers and then comes back to the van, wherever the van's at. Yeah, you remember that? I do. Uh, this is kind of like that, but without the mobile variant. Uh, so again, like it's just kind of cool to see all the different companies line up their uh, ideas and their technologies and see kind of where they succeed and where others fall flat. And then how can they basically take the ideas of the other companies for lack of a better term, and and uh, innovate on them to make this the most efficient thing that we have out there. Yeah, and I feel like something like this could, I don't know, in the next 20 years be the replacement for what we see those little blue post office boxes that sit yeah. on the road. You could basically go up to this and say where you need it to go, and it'll end up there yeah. in, in like maybe a quicker time frame than what we're used to in terms of transit for mail and stuff like that. Takes up a little bit more real estate than a blue mailbox. but That's true. But for now, anyway. For now, for now, yeah. I mean, I I could very easily see like an underground kind of um, container, and then this just shoots out of the ground. But then, I think I think something brilliant about this design is that the height of this is high enough so where like somebody couldn't mess with the drone. Like you got to be real tall to climb up on this thing, and the top kind of opens up, uh, like uh, kind of like an air hanger almost. Yeah, and it and it lets it out of the top, and so like you would have to. I would imagine if somebody was standing on top of it, the the doors wouldn't open. And um, it, the thing that's kind of genius to me is that there's it seems like there's more security built into this because of the height, you know, rather than just having like a street level thing. I don't know. So that nobody's just standing outside but waiting for the drone to come out and grab it or something like that. Or or maybe uh, yeah, maybe I'm just an idiot and and that's like a standard thing. I don't know. I don't know enough about drone delivery systems and. And all that, but I mean, we talk about them enough on the show. I should, but <laughs> well, I don't know because you d- we just mentioned like two very different strategies, right? Like something that's very stationary, probably providing a lot of different benefits versus right. the UPS mobile model. You know what? I will tell you though, this is going to change the way I do my mobile pickup delivery. This is going to th- th- instead of going out, they're going to just have store like Target's going to send me out a box from like this drone, and that'll be it. Just drop it on the doorstep. It'll be the same thing, but I don't have to go and get it. Yeah, could cut down the time and save energy and save the planet. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, we're going to be right back after this to break down the rest of the news stories. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. 
Thank you all. And remember, it depends. All right. Before we continue on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Forbes. Oh, I'm going to mess this one. DHL Group, Gray Scott, Bloomberg, and Gizmodo for all of our stories this week. If you want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media or join us on our Slack for links to the original articles. We are always posting stuff in Slack. And in fact, most of these stories, I think, this week are coming from... These are all um, user-sourced, I think. Yeah, these are all listeners. So so thank you guys for, for all of our stories this week. Uh, we love talking about what you guys want to talk about. So... Uh, if you're if you find something interesting that's human factors related, throw it in there because we want to put on a show that you want to hear. So, yeah, go go visit the Slack. Yeah, it's a good How place to that? be. All right, what do we, you know what, Blake? We never record this early. It is Memorial Day, so you know we're, we're Gives recording us a little more leeway. We're recording a little early, and the air conditioning just came on, and it feels amazing. Yeah, because by the time we actually get in here, it turns off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, what's up next? All right, so a lot of coverage has been done over the emergence of what is known as deep fakes in the last couple of years, and truth be told, they are both captivating and at times frightening. So the implication implications of this growing technology are practically lim- limitless, especially as our ability to tell the difference between what is real and what is fake diminishes even further. And just when you thought that you could take a breather, Samsung has decided to develop a new artificial intelligence system that makes generating deep fakes that much easier. So using nothing more than a single image, the AI system known as few-shot adversarial learning is able to create a fake clip that seemingly allows the image to burst into life. So most deep fakes, for most deep fakes to work, the system involved usually requires several photos or footage to train on in order to actually adapt itself or properly adapt itself to what you want. So with this new system, however, you would only need as little as one image to create highly realistic talking heads. And if you wish to increase the realism and identi- identity preservation, you simply would need to feed the system a few more frames something like one or two. So for now, the technology is a little bit limited, but try imagining the possibility of integrating something like this into mixed reality with tech of this kind of AI. Oh, yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah, that could really get insane very, very fast. Although, like Nick and I kind of played around with earlier, we took a test on some deep fake. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just talk about deep fake Deep fake technology, like in at general. the highest level here, really quick. Sure. So, so yeah, you and I were talking about earlier how um, you know, Joe Rogan, who hosts another podcast that has almost as many listeners as Human Factors Cast, um, you know, he he actually has uh, th- th- there was what was it like this this um, I forget is some AI thing that basically generated his voice, and uh, we took a quiz on you know which which things were real and which ones were fake, things that he actually said. And, like, it's pretty convincing. I'll play a little sample here um, of of the uh, Joe Rogan deepfake. Nice. Let's see here. What do we got? Yeah, here we Friends, go. Friends, I've got something new to tell all of you. I've decided to sponsor a hockey team made up entirely of chimps. I'm tired of people telling me that chimps are not capable of kicking human ass in sports. Chimps are just superior athletes. And these chimps have been working out hard. The throwing kettlebells, battle ropes, everything. I've got them on a strict diet of bone broth and elk meat. These chimps will rip your balls off. God damn, it's impressive. <laughs> All I got to say is, see you on the ice, folks. So, so, <laughs> so I mean, like that, that was all deep fake generated. Like that, that, his voice um, was that, that's not him talking. No, yeah, it's like cuts. It's, it's hilarious because I can tell where some of it's like cuts from, you know, commercials and things that they do. Um, but it's, it is pretty realistic. I mean, obviously it's talking about a silly topic, but with him, you really never really, you never know what he's going to kind of bring up or think up. Cause he is along with a commentator. He's just a comedian in general. Uh, so that is, it is pretty convincing. And when we were taking the quiz, I mean, it was hard to tell the difference between a lot of some of the voice fakes versus what was real. Yeah. Okay. So, so, okay. Think about what that is that produced something from nothing. Um, and, or, or I guess something from, Probably hundreds of thousands of hours of like I, I don't know how many episodes does Joe Rogan have. He has a couple somewhere more in the thousands, and they're three hours long a piece. Right, so he has thousands of hours of his audio out there, and he's, that's just podcasts. Right, that's just podcasts. He is a celebrity. Like YouTube across like all the other stuff that he's done before, and, and even if you really want to get crazy, like thinking about other mediums and other places that he's done stuff before, like his comedy album, stuff on Instagram. You could there's just a lot right. of data for anybody really you can pull from in terms of getting their voice, getting their face, all that stuff. 
yeah, so there's a lot of things that you can pull from. Now, my point with this is that, uh, that that's a lot of data, and it has produced something. I, I don't know if somebody put a script there, and they produced it to that script. Like, it was able to generate, you know, you know like, if you were to text-to-speech it, and it's now Joe Rogan's voice, or if that was, like, generated content from nothing. Oh, I get what you're saying. Yeah. So, so either I, I, way, I'm not sure. It's either way, it's scary. So now <laughs> let's get back to this story here. Um, there is another thread of deepfakes that is going along, and basically, like, let's say there's a source video of you and I talking. Someone could then take a model of somebody else's face, like let's say Joe Rogan, right? That somebody could take Joe Rogan's face and slap it on me or Blake. And it could be Joe Rogan talking to Joe Rogan as Nick and Blake. And it's his face mapped to our face uh, and our facial structures. And it looks pretty good, right? But again, that's from a large sample mapped to a sample of our faces at different angles. Uh, and what? Th- so this is kind of the next step. So this is basically saying, okay, let's say you have a picture of Nick and Blake and not a running video that it has you know, all that data to build a model on. Now it is saying, okay, I have one picture of Nick and Blake. I have this model of Joe Rogan, and I'm going to apply it to this picture of Nick and Blake and make those pictures come to life as Joe Rogan, as Nick and Blake. Are you confused yet? Because basically what this is saying is you can take a still image and project some model, some movement onto that image and now make it look like that image is moving based on trained data. Like now, Absolutely, yeah. So... This is uh, big for a couple of reasons, but the, the biggest reason is that now you don't need like source video. You can kind of generate this content just from an image. Yeah, and if it's if that's not good enough, all you need is a couple more images, and then you're you're really cooking. Yeah. So uh, this obviously uh, there's a, there's a lot of ethics involved with deepfakes, and I don't know if this is the place for those conversations. Those conversations happen in other places, but. How is this human factors, and how can we apply this to human factors? Because I can think of one direct thing that we talked about before the show, which would be kind of interesting to do as an experiment. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So were you talking about if we basically use this created our podcast yeah. using ourselves? Yeah. Okay. 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 So let me lay out the premise for our listeners here. Okay. So imagine um, we, Blake and I, go through our 130 episodes plus all the interviews that we've done. And train an artificial intelligence to recognize not only our voice, um, but we also train it based on the 30 episodes or so that we have a video. Um, so we generate sort of these video models of us, and we mix and match the two, and we create a script based on um, you know news stories for a week, and we see if it can create an episode based on that. Right? Like we're still creating the script, and we're still talking back and forth to each other, like. I'd imagine we'd do this over Slack, like, hey, this thing is really cool, and blah, 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 blah. Oh, and this, and that, and the other thing. Um, And to see if we can go back and forth on that and fill up, like, probably half hour of content or something. It'd be kind of crazy to see if we could do that. Yeah, it's it's got to be possible because a lot of the a lot of the cool stuff about some well maybe not Samsung's in general, but definitely deep fake AI. I'm sure there are open source tools to kind of create your own, right? Yeah. Oh yes, they you can are either, out like there. build your own model or whatever it may be. So I mean, it's it's definitely possible. And if we want to get real nuts, I mean, we could even turn this into something in mixed reality. Yeah, uh, yeah. Could you imagine putting like a three D um, a three D camera right in front of us and having people watch us in VR, but then have our bodies be produced by these digital avatars that are mapped to these deep fakes? That make that it we're look, creating through Slack. Yeah. Basically giving it content for it to spew yeah. out and have our mannerisms and act the way that we do. Yeah. That'd be uh that'd be crazy. Because there is enough like hundreds of hours for us to at least have a, a solid baseline of kind of our different interactions, different moods that we may be in or different facial expressions. Like, that's insane. It's just too scary. Yeah, I mean, look, like we're if you look at Samsung's uh like applying to a singular image, like it's still very rough. However, I think you mentioned this in the blurb too. Like, imagine how crazy this could be once um, you know that the artificial intelligence gets perfected and um, really like starts to develop uh, beyond just this rudimentary like one image. Like, even just looking at this is kind of crazy. Like, this is all based on one image. But yeah, it's it's pretty nuts. And so, where where does it go? Like, there, there's 
again, like a lot of ethical concerns, like who is really saying these things and your privacy and data and all that. It's a whole can of worms I don't even want to open. But it's if for like a from a again trying to be more on the human factors perspective. How do you even? What can you do to help prepare other people to try and spot this kind of stuff? Or are there even things that we as humans can do or look or be paying attention to that would key us into, okay, maybe that is a deep fake. Maybe it's not real. Or do or will at some point, if we get to this, you know, if somebody if something's taken in like 32 frames where it looks very, very real, can you even worry about a human spotting it anymore? Yeah. You almost have to have AI to spot the AI. Yeah, and then it's an AI war to outsmart the AI, and then it's just going to get exponentially better because each system is going to get better at detecting the like flaws. And then we're just sitting in our autonomous vehicles trying not to crash into things. And then it's the singularity, and then everybody, yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, over. It, I, I don't even know what else to say about this. Like, Be careful out there. Make sure you're not recording unnecessary video of yourself or audio of yourself and putting it out on the internet every week for people to listen to and enjoy. Yeah, be quite, um, quite uh, ready for something to appear from your own content, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it just, it, like, it kind of, uh, it doesn't worry me because I, I don't think we have nearly enough people that listen to the show. We have a few, but, like, I don't, I don't think anyone's out there with malicious intent with us. Like, I think we're relatively safe, but it worries me for other, like, higher profile people. Sure. Who... You know, they're they're basically their whole career is about like advocacy or something for uh, some cause. And if you can basically manipulate that individual to say something that contradicts that uh, that cause, then it's like that's ex- incredibly damaging to that person's brand, which is their personality. Or I mean, if we if we really want to get scary, it can be applied to somebody like a president saying something they didn't say. Yeah, which maybe may or may not incite some sort of war or conflict whatever it may be yeah Um, and we we live in a world where we know we have to be very attentive and analytical in the stuff that we just read much less like the the videos that we're watching or the interviews and points of view that other people have like we're having to pay attention to just like news articles on facebook or that come to your inbox and make sure like is this real or is this just some nonsense do i even have time to check it out if we don't have time to figure out whether you know, stuff that we're reading or trying to absorb is real or not. Right. How are we going to go looking through videos and assume, like, the first time we see something that it's not as real as it can be? Yeah. It's uh, terrifying, but... Crazy. It's it's crazy to see how far technology is coming and how quickly it's this AI stuff is really adapting and becoming a big player in our very small world. You know, I wonder how good this uh, these deep fakes are at, like, showing true human emotion just through, like, facial expressions. Yeah, I feel like it's gonna it's gonna go back to what we've talked about a couple times now. It's like if we give it just one image, maybe it sucks, but maybe thirty two images and it's great. Right. Well, I mean, like, I, I I feel like hopefully emotion can be conveyed in another way to where some automated system, maybe Amazon's, uh, you know, device that can detect human emotion, might be. A oh, good I see what you're ah, trying to do. There. To there it is. Segway. There it is. All right. Give me a little uh, segue. Very good, Riding very around. good. <laughs> Golden segue award. Yeah. All right. So Amazon Inc., like Nick was saying, is developing a voice-activated wearable that can recognize human emotions. So the wrist worn gadget is described as a health and wellness product in internal documents reviewed by Bloomberg. It is designed to work with a smartphone app. The device has microphones paired with software that can discern the wearer's emotional state from sound of his or her voice. And eventually, the technology could be able to advise the wear how, how to interact more effectively with others. It's unclear how far this project <laughs> project is, or whether it will actually become a commercial device. The technology could help com- could help the company gain insights for potential health products, or be used to better target advertising or product recommendations. I think the latter may or may not be what they want to do with it. But this is pretty awesome because if if you can integrate something. I don't know. I've I've got a real soft spot and in my head for health and wellness products. And yep. if this could be something that helps helps with somebody that has depression, right? Like maybe if it can tell from the tone of their voice that they are just not feeling so hot today, and maybe provide suggestions of things to do or like go for a walk in the sunshine, get a workout in, maybe even tell you to interact with a friend or put you in contact with a friend. Uh, I feel like there's a lot of utility for something like this. Now, there's also, of course, the conflict 
or the the converse to this, which could be used to you know have better targeted product advertising, because maybe if you're not feeling so good, you're a little more impulsive, so you may buy or shop more. Oh, you're getting into the deep dark sort of secret that Amazon doesn't want to know you about. Click here to find out more. I th- look like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I I agree. I think um, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about privacy and and how basically we can protect consumers from uh, their their data being manipulated in ways that don't benefit them. And it's a whole other can of worms that I don't want to get into in just a, you know, 10 hour or 10 seconds. A 10 hour podcast with Nick and Blake. You're ready, guys. uh, We're only one hour in. That will, yeah, yeah. Stay tuned for the next nine hours (laughs) because we're going to jump right in to privacy. Okay, Blake, what do you think? No, um, I think... This is uh, th- this opens up a whole another sort of a whole other domain of privacy and data that it has to be considered, and I, d- I don't I don't know how I feel about it. Let me just put it that way: I don't know how I feel about this yet. And yeah, I, I see obviously the pros and the cons, and um, you know it's funny that I have a not a problem with an always on listening device, but when it comes to emotion, it's like that I think is some sort of uh, can be seen as some weakness and ex- uh, certainly emotions are exploitable. And I think that's where the difference is for me is that like, I guess if you can determine emotion from speech as well, which I'm sure you can to some degree, but I, I feel like facial emotions and micro expressions are much harder to hide and if you exploit those, then it's like you're basically sort of exploiting a vulnerable population. Absolutely, yeah. I don't know, man. Th- this one's weird to me. See, I like to look on the lighter side of it, baby, because I, I want to be an enthusiast for tech in the health and wellness space. And I, there's definitely ways this can be used against you. But I, I think it might inform us a little bit more as a population to what's going on. I'm going to use the depression example again because I'm more familiar with it, right? But if you're using something like a wrist-worn gadget, like say this was combined with your Samsung watch or my Fitbit, and it could hear me talking and then put that together with some of your health data for the day and either help it to tailor solutions that it knows if like right. it gets your, this is a silly example, but it get, if you get your heart rate to a certain point, it, it knows that you feel better, whether like it's because endorphins are released, whatever, your voice just typically sounds better after you, you know, elevate your heart rate for a specific amount of time. Right. So I feel like, Using that in combination with, you know, different meditation apps or different health and fitness apps that exist out there, it could provide people a better quality of life, but also could inform, you know, scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists about what's really, is there like some more biological signs of depression or other mental disorders that you could kind of exploit the wrong word, but use the data to try and figure out other ways besides just medication or just interventions through talking. Yeah, you could use it for treatment and things like that. But you're you're completely right and it's part of part of my fear that it's coming from Amazon. I have nothing against Amazon. I use their products all right. the time. Yeah. But I could see this being something like, okay, just like how Facebook better targets people through using data. If you can collect data like this and analyze it and make your product better and make you more money, the companies are gonna do it. Yeah. Especially sure. like a giant conglomerate like Amazon. Yeah, this whole data privacy thing. Okay, so here we go. We're strapping in for a nine-hour podcast. The whole data privacy thing is um, actually something that I I feel like I just was uh, schooled on a little bit more. Um, I, I, I learned a lot more about it. Than, Somebody take you to school about it? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I listened to a podcast about it that kind of really opened my eyes to the dangers. What podcast was it? Um, I don't want to – I don't care to share right now. Uh, on that one, I'm I'm still developing an opinion on it, and I'm not ready to endorse it one way or the other. Yet. Gotcha. Um, but I, uh, listening to it, they are really highlighting sort of the 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 problems with data privacy. Um, so anyway, that that's that's the short of the nine hour podcast <laughs> is that I I know a lot more than I did, and I'm I'm still processing everything, and I I'm not quite ready to talk about it yet, but um. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, something like this definitely kind of opens the door for more of that data to be collected about you. Um, and I guess sort of my my big takeaway with this is that, like, 
it's amazing how little information you need to provide for people to collect information on you. And this is a lot of information on, on somebody, um, especially if it's like down to the facial expressions of a person. Um, Cause you can get something just based on clicks. And like, I, I did not know how much data you can get just based on clicks in an application. Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And how, how big companies build profiles on you based on these clicks. It's crazy. Um, well, I think part of the problem with the, the data privacy conversation, it's one that should continue to happen. And I think there's a lot of ways that companies can be more proactive about like being upfront with how they're using your data or you, people like you and I, consumers being more informed about how to maybe safeguard ourselves. But I think at the end of the day, we kind of run into this same problem that we do with a lot of different emerging technologies or even things like the impact of how people eat, right? You only know as much as you know at the time, but for us with data privacy, right. it's such a new problem, but it's also a problem that's going to continue to emerge as things like AI get bigger, voice recognition, use of voice UIs gets bigger, giving more information through your Fitbits or through any any devices like this that maybe we're recording your voice. We're, ha we're going to be at a point where we've already gone too far and we're only realizing the repercussions before we can even make projections about that now. And I think that's, that's ultimately the problem with the data privacy conversation. We just don't know what's coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's definitely a, a conversation for another time. Um, but I want to make sure we have time to get to uh, some of our listener questions, but uh, we got one more story. Absolutely. All right. So almost two years ago, Google parent alphabet remind, reminded the world that Google glass wasn't dead yet. So it was just for regular, it wasn't just, it just wasn't ready for regular consumers. So rebranding Google Glass as an enterprise tool for blue collar factory workers and doctors was a savvy move that breathed new life in, into the Google Glass product. Alphabet is building on the progress it made in the switch to enterprise with some refresh hardware for Google Glass. It also tran is transitioning Glass from the experimental X division to Google proper. So a blog post announcing the update explains better CP a better CPU will supposedly enable better battery life and performance for tasks involving computer vision and machine learning. The new glasses also improve the camera for better video and live streaming and adds a USB-C port for faster charging. Most notably, the new glasses are built on Android and support Android Enterprise mobile device management. That'll make it easier for com companies to build new apps and integrate the glasses integrate into the glasses into existing services or APIs. So whether or not Google will ever attempt to make consumer focused smart glasses is debatable, but a move towards the consumer market would depend on solving problems like style, functionality, and privacy factors that doom the original glass, but aren't quite as lethal in the enterprise space. So it, it's kind of odd. I don't know what you think about this, Nick, but it's kind of odd to me that they're really trying to push this more consumer Google Glass um, adoption because it's. I think that it was truly like an awesome technology for them to develop, but it just didn't hit its mark in the right target market. And when it found its life in the enterprise world, I don't, I don't know what they're really trying to gain or what they think they're going to do in the consumer world or what real benefit it's going to bring. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I I don't know. So right now they're focusing on enterprise, right? And and they're hoping to come back to consumer at some point. Um, and I, I think a lot of the consumer desires is, is along the lines of the sort of pie in the sky augmented reality stuff, right? Like navigation, like uh, video, phone calls, or whatever, what have you, right? But I, I, I don't know. We're, we're not there yet for sure. And it, I'm curious to see what kind of applications in enterprise um, makes this a better solution uh, for that when a lot of the tasking that you might do there, I don't know. We've seen, we've seen other uh, companies do the headsets. Yeah. HoloLens, HoloLens is a big one, especially one in them. the same kind of domain of enterprise or blue collar work as they called it. Yeah. And I just don't know what Google Glass can offer that the HoloLens can't. Uh, when it seems like HoloLens has kind of carved out a, a, a sector for itself. Like we saw the integration with the hard hats. Um, and uh, like the Google Glass, what do they call this? The Glass Enterprise Edition 2. Um, the, it doesn't, I don't know, like the, the screen real estate is very small, uh, still looks 
clunky and not nearly as protective of the eyes. I don't know. Like I have a lot of criticisms about this. Um, I I think it's interesting, but beyond that, like I, I would like to see what sort of applications require a lighter weight. I, and I'm sure they exist. I just am struggling to conjure them right now. Like what kind of applications require a lighter weight um, headset that also can operate within a reduced field of view? Um, you know, that maybe the hollow lens isn't sort of uh, ready for prime time yet. Maybe, yeah. I'm not really sure what they're looking to do. I think ultimately they're just trying to continue to grow the technology to get it to a point where it's going the way, especially the way things are looking. It looks like they're just continuing to try and grow the tech a little bit more, add some kind of lighter weight stuff so that eventually it can be in consumer land. Because right now I just don't see this doesn't feel like you're going to put it on people with hard hats. Right, like no. what we've seen before. This it is very like, lightweight, like fashionable glasses almost. It almost feels like office desk. Yeah, me. like you're going to be, you know, looking at your Outlook calendar projected on the wall trying yeah. to schedule a meeting with the person next to you or something like that. Yep. Um. So I'm just not quite sure about what they're trying to do. I think it's great they're trying to keep the technology moving, um, but right now it just kind of se- it seems like it's in a middle phase. Um, of course, like and we talked about this a bunch of times, and I think, uh, and we've talked about it with Hollands as well. I think this has had a, a pretty big impact in the medical sector, in terms of like ha- I guess giving information to doctors with just these Google glasses on or nurses, whatever it may be. Um, but other than other than that, I'm not quite sure what they're gonna what the real aim is. It's great that the power is getting getting to a place where it's much more. You know, it's ramping up a little bit more. I like the idea that they're kind of rolling in the Android Enterprise software into this. And yeah. They're, and they're just hoping that, okay, people are kind of like Alexa Skills has, to, has turned into a big thing with developers. Maybe this will be the same thing for Google Glass. Like, it'll be some, hoping. some experimental place people can go and develop apps. And maybe that maybe they're looking to the development community to try and push the envelope of what you could do with the tech. Uh, to give them a little more insight into what are, what would people even want this for? What what's the kind of like limits that you can reach? Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see what applications they come up with. Um, but I want to make sure we have time for our listener questions. So let's go ahead and get into. It came from. It came from. All right. This is the normally the part of the show where I say it came from Reddit, but it didn't come from Reddit this week. It came from our email. 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 So uh, yeah, yeah, we we it got came an, from email blurb or something. We got an email from a listener, and uh, they wrote in with some really great questions. I want to make sure we have time to answer them on the show. So I'm gonna kind of truncate this email just a little bit, but um, we'll make sure to cover the important bits. All right, uh, dear Nick and Blake, good evening. My name is uh, Fabrizio, and I am a recent graduate student from FIU, Miami, Florida. I come seeking advice as I have changed my goals of pursuing a PhD in cognitive neuroscience to pursuing a PhD or master's in human factors when I discovered the field. I'm currently in my gap year and will be applying by December, which means that I have over six months where I can be working in something human factors related. Here are the questions. Where can I find internships? There's none in his area. There's only senior jobs. Uh, What are some companies or people I should be contacting for these opportunities? What skills should I be learning or self-teaching at the moment to make me more competitive? Uh, what advice do you guys have for me? The internet has so little information on this field, sadly. Thank you both for this amazing podcast and inspiring me to make a career change. Uh, okay, so Blake, I want to jump into these questions. Let's start with the first one here. Where can they find internships? Well, if so you mentioned that in your area there's only kind of like senior level jobs. Um, what you could do is you could look or you could poke around the website for those senior jobs that you were looking at. If you're interested in any of the companies, the products they create, or maybe if you even know somebody, you could reach out and see if they offer internships and maybe it's not listed on their website or right. give them a compelling reason why it would be good for to have you as an intern. That kind of stuff. That's one way you can poke around. Another way that I've done it just a couple times is just try hitting up LinkedIn for any companies that you like. And look for any technical recruiters that may work at that company. Uh, so that's one way I've gone about looking for internships, and it's worked out a couple times before. Um, but I don't know. Do you have any kind of really pointed ways to find an internship? So I will offer this uh, one piece of advice. So don't take your college career center for granted. Um, oh, that's another good point. They are yeah. there to help you. So go go check them out and tell them kind of like, 
I know your circumstances are a, a little different coming from a cognitive neuroscience background um, to wanting to work in human factors. I don't think it's that big of a difference because um, you're still talking about human psychology and w- Wiles' different systems and cognitive versus neuroscience. Like, it's it's still cognitive. So, like, I I, I think there's a lot of overlap there. So, g- that's that's a good thing. Um, so if you go to your college career center and and uh, like even if you're graduated, that's you can still find help there. That's that's a good place to go. It's a good resource. Um, potentially, like look at LinkedIn. Like Blake said, um, potentially not necessarily the recruiters, but maybe through your network. And um, you know, if you have a network of a few human factors people, you can start to branch off and see like, oh, where did they get internships? What types of companies are they looking at? Uh, where did they have success? And at least you know, reaching out to people that you know, um, that is sort of one way. Uh, to make sure that I don't know, there's there's that level of comfort there. I feel like when you can reach out to someone, hey, you know, like I know we haven't talked in a while, but I saw you got an internship at this company. How did that process go, and who can I contact? You know, um, absolutely. You can so, be very casual about that kind yeah. of stuff too. It's not like you're you have to directly ask them, like, hey, can I can you help me get an internship? You can ask about what the process is like. Right. Did, did did they even like it? Do they like working where they are? Yeah, although like I understand your situation is like you're just now getting into it, so it might be a little bit difficult to have uh, connections that way. Um, reach out to people on our Slack. That's a good way. Yeah, um, that's one way to find out about opportunities for, for sure. sure. Yeah, one thing that might be worth doing because I'm ass- I'm assuming in this again, this could be completely wrong, but if you don't have a local chapter of HFES near you or at your school, um, maybe it's worth trying to start some kind of chapter at the school, that's a good way to spend some of your time or just checking out HFES.org. Yeah, I was going to say, HFES.org has a, a, a job openings or, or a, like I'm going to mess this up, but it's a... You got some sort of job board, right? Yeah, it's um, it's employment opportunities. And, uh, you know, while they are looking for full-time um, folks, like you might actually be able to find uh, internships at those companies too. You just... I, like look at the companies that are hiring for those positions and then see if they're hiring uh, for internships as well. It also depends on what you're looking for. Cause it may be that if you're, if you're searching for human factors only, you might not be getting as wide a variety of possibilities as if you right. included, like if you want to do you UX. Know, research, do UX research. And you usually see that they want like an HCI, a human factors degree or something like that. Right. So that's another blanket term to start using. Right. And I mean, like, uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again. There are some people in the community that kind of look down on the UI UX thing and say, oh, that's cute, but it's not human factors. Whatever. Apply the thing that you know to that job. Like you can bring you that job can be whatever you bring to it. And so especially if you're looking for an internship, don't worry about that kind of stigma. That's not no one's going to look down on you for that. Anyway, it's anybody that's saying that is not really something you need to be con- be concerned about i yeah, don't think yeah it's gatekeeping in, in its worst form yeah <laughs> there you go um so yeah i think that kind of tackled the first two questions where can i find internships um where are some companies and people i should be looking for uh and then uh what skills should i be learning or self-teaching at the moment to make me more competitive so this is a great one blake yeah this is a lot of fun and it i am there's there's something that i want to encourage across all three of these questions because i think it's I think by knowing the answer to this or having some ideas about it is going to help you answer the questions for yourself. But what, what type of field do you want to work in? I mean, are you, do you want to deal with like physical product design, like with stuff like that may be more closer to ergonomics or are you kind of on Nick's side of the house where you like VR and mixed reality? So knowing kind of the field of where you'd like to apply the knowledge of both cognitive neuroscience and human factors methodology, I think that can help you kind of figure out what, okay, what companies does it make sense to try and you go see if they have internships or what people are in those fields that are notable, maybe even professors that are doing research and, you know, mixed AR or whatever it may be. And I think that'll kind of help you figure out what skills you may want to learn as well. Yeah. Um, I think I, I failed to mention it, but I, I took this part out, but uh, they're interested in neuro ergonomics uh, right now. I just, that's right. But I, I think we can sort of, you know, blanket statement that for anyone else who might be in a similar situation. Um, yeah, apply it to what you're interested in and wh- your area. Or just nail that down first and then kind of go 
dive deeper on it from there, like dive into the where and the who and the different companies and that kind of stuff. But in terms of skills, if you're if you really like the the world of human factors, I encourage you and I so I'm gonna give you the name of a book and I'm probably gonna screw it up. So I'll go home, look at it, make sure and put it in Slack. But there's a I think there's a book called it's by Alice or Tolbert and or no, Albert and Tullis, and it's called Measuring the User Experience. And it goes through a lot of kind of the methodology of human factors, or at least what I experienced in school. So that's a great place to start, like learn some of the human factors methods, because if you already know it, you could apply it to an internship, you could apply it to when you go to your go to a human factors program, you can write about having the experience. Um, if you're interested in it, start trying to pick up different things about learning how to code. It could be useful from like a Python perspective if you are more into the analysis and data analysis type stuff, mm -hmm. or if you're interested in even in like machine learning or AI, um, or if you like design and development, it may be worth just trying to get get yourself up on the normal stack of like HTML and JavaScript and CSS. Yeah, there's, um I in terms of like learning and self-teaching, there's a lot of really great resources out there. Um, the, uh, there's a whole suite of like UI UX uh, human factors stuff on lynda.com, which oh, is yeah. like a, a LinkedIn company that you can basically like say, Hey, I took all these classes and attach them to your LinkedIn profile. And so people see it's effectively useless. No one actually looks at those things and says, Oh yeah, this person took all these classes. They're smart. I don't uh, know, man. Cause but, a recruiter reached out to me and actually mentioned Linda or LinkedIn learning classes that I had taken and like some code Academy certifications oh. that, that I had put on my LinkedIn profile and actually were asking me questions about teaching based off of that. That's interesting because so, so it, 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 I think it gains more merit as time goes on. Cause people really like, I don't know, they really stare at your LinkedIn profile or take it for yeah. more than maybe it's worth. I, I don't know. Like I've never had success with that. I never had any recruiters reach out to me for that very specific purpose, but uh, my recommendation still stands like those LinkedIn, those lynda.com classes are really good and they teach you a lot about the basics. If you're just getting into a program, those are like a great overview to kind of take before you jump in uh, as a starting point to kind of know what you're in for um, and teaches you techniques and methodology to, to sort of jump in with that uh, head start knowledge. So, okay. Any other closing words for this one, Blake? No, but if we didn't answer the questions or you have follow-up questions, you can always get Nick and I either in the Slack or through the show email. Oh, I'm planning to reach out to this one. This one, he had a couple other really specific questions that I want to answer. So, yeah, if you guys have any questions, though, yeah, that's a perfect uh, segue to exit the show. Yeah, if you guys have any questions uh, like uh, Fabrizio did, you can always reach out to us. Um, you know, we're uh, any of the social channels at H Factors Podcast. You can reach out to us at show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider uh, supporting us on Patreon. And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to find out where to go and get a name change? If you want to get your name changed, you can always ask me questions about it at Don't Panic UX across social media. All right. That was a little Easter egg because we still had Elise in there from when you guys. Anyway, uh, special thanks to Jeff Olson each and every week for video editing. Uh, as for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. It depends. <laughs>